Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Laverne Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. We've got a very special show. It is with two of our leading lawmakers who have handled financial matters in the Senate and other matters for 60 years between the two of you. So our guests today are Senator John Arthur Smith, Democrat from Deming. You've been here since? 1989. Mm. And Senator Stu Engel, a Republican from Portales. Actually, you've got five counties in your district, don't you? Well, I think five, yes, yes. I, I, five or maybe six, but I know I've got at least five. It's plenty, and you've got four. <laughs> four. So together you've been here six years, but when did you come up? I was elected in the fall of 1984, sworn in the spring or January of 1985. And you live in you 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 live near Portales. Still you live in Portales, yeah. And um, I'm honored to say that recently the New Mexico Mining Association gave you the Ben Altimirano Award for your help and acknowledgement of the importance of the mining industry. It was a lovely evening and a well-deserved honor. Well, I appreciate the award, and the mining industry is a, is certainly a big part of New Mexico, and hope it will always stay that way. Uh, we hope so too. Now, one thing that always stays this way is that every session. You do it, us and the, the people of New Mexico the honor of coming here to explain what is happening with state finances. And we've had some rough, rough years. And I've always depended on you. I want to add that we are filming with three weeks to go in the session, so anything can happen. But I wanted to step back a little and look at a little big picture thing because you, uh, there's a, we're at a budget deficit for two fiscal years and there's no, nothing left in the reserves. There must be another way to run a railroad. There must be another way to finance state government. Would you, before we get into the specifics, maybe step back a little and look at um, if we were creating an ideal world, which you funnily said, if we had enough money, that would solve all the problems. But there must be another way of funding state government so that we don't have to go through this harrowing budget process. Would either of you like to start with that? I'll yield to the chairman of finance. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's called dumping on me yeah. right there. <laughs> the, uh, you, you know, Lorraine, we've been in uh, a difficult time since basically 2009, 2008, and we all sit back and say, well, it'll go away soon, it'll go away soon, and it's going to be back to normal. Um, but when you've had basically eight and nine years uh, this may very well be the typical times rather than the atypical times mm -hmm. uh, on that. And with that in mind, I think obviously we need to step, step back and say, how are we going to raise revenues uh, that are reliable and, and stable? Uh, our uh, oil and gas situation has been extremely generous to all New Mexicans. All, all the extractive industries have. And people during tough times say, well, you need to put more on their back. But they have delivered so much, but it's pretty much uh, precarious now. Uh, the products that they're producing are uh, much more sensitive to world events than what they were, say, 30 years ago uh, on, on that. So with, with that in mind, uh, I, I do believe that we're going to have to uh, look at other avenues to stabilize our revenues. And, and I think that uh, can be accomplished. The problem you get into, you have an awful lot of special interest groups that are saying, well, leave us alone, but hit somebody else. And all New Mexicans are going to have to be in this uh, revamp, uh, a reset, uh, for us to come up with a stable uh, revenue stream. Well, and John's right on a lot of those things because we have uh, we had some big years in the oil business, and when you have big years of, of, of tremendous amounts of dollars coming in to the state we we fund things and this, we try to make sure our, we have to always have a balanced budget and uh, 
We've had pretty good reserves, but now the reserves are gone, and uh, we a lot of our reserves in some of the departments are gone too. The highway department had massive reserves until we built a train with them, and now they don't have any reserves either. So, every aspect of government has to have dollars to operate on, and we've we've had a couple of sessions now. We've cut ma major cuts all the way through public ed, higher ed. Every department has had to have some cuts. And we're going to be at this, looking at the same situation here. We've basically solved the problem to finish out this year to June 30th the best we can. That was a main task we, we've spent about three weeks doing. Now then we're looking forward and basically we're in a new 30-day session that's looking at the budget for that starts July 1st. And the House has got a bill coming over, House Bill 2. There's always things that are, are put in on the House side, and uh, sometimes we make adjustments on those in the Senate, and uh, there's always going to be a picture here of how can we fund and how can we build our reserves. And there's ideas out there from all aspects on a lot of different things to maybe even the playing field with uh, asking folks that ship things on the Internet and stuff to pay a gross receipts tax to the state of New Mexico. You know, it's, uh, you can look at it any way you want to. A lot of people say, well, that's evening the field, and it is. But we have local merchants that have to pay the gross receipts tax. Everybody should if we're going to have ordering and things like that. Lots of other states have passed this, and it's been some new revenues come in. It's a real wild guess as to how much, the, how much the, that money will come in. There's a lot of talk about some things on hospitals and things like that, on nonprofits and profits, on gross receipts tax. There's a lot of things there. John and I have a bill co-sponsored that, that touches on those areas. And, uh, you know, the, the medical part of, of New Mexico, in a lot of cases, is doing pretty well with their revenue. So we're going to look at some of those things and see how that will help the state. We've, we've made de massive cuts in lots of things, and it's going to be pretty hard to do a lot more of that. So we're going to have to hopefully keep things as even as we can, but we've still got to keep the state going, and that takes dollars, and we've got to figure out where they're going to come from and how we're going to do it. And, you know, I think that turns us back to what brought us here. And oftentimes we're looking and we're pleased to have the Facebooks of the world locate here, but we've got to be more cognizant of the people that are already here. Every state in the union is trying to recruit the biggie. Uh, we've got to see how can we grow the businesses that we already have in this state uh, where they hire more people and obviously uh, those people will be paying more taxes. Uh, I don't think we've had enough emphasis uh, in this state on the people that brought us here, just like the universities in our respective communities that we have. You have it at Vertalis, and right. we have it at Western. On that, I go speak to those people, and they just sort of take those universities for granted when, in fact, they're huge economic development centers in our rural areas Absolutely. Uh, on, on that. And I think we're going to have to redirect our emphasis to make certain that, yes, we do want big companies coming in, but let's not forget the ones that we already have. We're very fortunate. Uh, we have a lot of smaller companies that are generating jobs. Those companies need a reliable uh, state government, uh, predictable on what we're going to be doing. The situation we're in right now, we cannot gain guarantee predictability to them mm -hmm. uh, on that. We're robbing <coughs> Peter to pay Paul. Uh, so any effort that we have in the future should be directed on stability. Uh, a, a, even a poor plan is much better than a deal mm -hmm. uh, on that. But we want to come up with a good plan and try and avoid the short-term deals uh, on that. And so I would uh, hope that our colleagues in the legislature and the citizens of the state, well, what's a long-term plan? I mean, we get knee-jerk re responses from people, well, you ought to do this, you ought to do this. Uh, but you still have to be responsible. Uh, we have some fundamental responsibilities in this state, uh, education being one. We're one of the few states that fund public education totally at the state level. I'm not talking about the capital expenditures, and we're, we've, we're taking the capital expenditures right now and taking a t huge chunk of that and bringing it into the state and amortizing it with everyone rather than leaving it up to local governments. But the bottom line is education is expensive. It's expensive in every state. Uh, I go off to conferences, and the center of discussion is going to be education, public ed, higher ed, and health care. 
uh, on, on that. And so uh, we need to focus on uh, taking care of our basic basically the common denominators that we're required to take care of. Well, and we've got some areas in this state that have have genuine job growth that's there. Uh, one of them is in, uh, is in my Senate district in Chavez County. The uh, Chavez County uh, uh, Airport, or the old Chavez County Air Base, Walker Air Force Base, huge bomber base in the 60s. And it was closed overnight to, uh, in the 60s because they voted for the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing of it is, is the business potential there and the job potential there is unlimited, unlimited. They just need a few million dollars to help build some things and build hangars where the largest jets in the world can be brought in there and be serviced and painted. And it's there, they'll get, you don't find airports like that anymore. These bomber bases like that, three mile runways, three feet thick, I mean, 100 yards wide, that's how wide the runways are. And the massive amount of potential there is absolutely unlimited to what that can be done. And it's unbelievable the amount of work they're doing now. The average salary there's, you know, in the mid 40s and plus the benefits are after that. And it's, a, it's got growth potential that's unbelievable. And as John says, Every, every part of this state, we have, we have our local universities spread out all, all over the state, Western, Eastern, Highlands, and New Mexico Tech, UNM. We have a wonderful university system. We've got a lots and lots of community colleges that some of them are gonna have to take a hard look and can they stay open and can they exist? But the thing about it is we have done so much in this state to, to make education as easy for all of our college students as we possibly can. You know, you hear talk now, well, the, gosh, the lottery may only pay 60% of the tuition. My God, mm -hmm. 60%. Yeah. Who won't buy that? Yeah. Because, you know, we used to pay 100, but tuition went up. There was a cash cow that the universities saw out there, and boom, tuition has risen way faster than it should have. But anyway, that's the horse that's already out of the gate and out of the barn. The thing we've got to do is make sure that we can get these values done and make sure we're make, making the most out of our money. And we're going to have to make some tough decisions this session and see the best way we can to make New Mexico look like a forward-looking state that's not afraid to put its money where its mouth is and make sure we're successful. Well... Go, yeah, I know you have a response. You, you know, I was just going to add on that tuition. We are one of the lowest tuition states <clears throat> uh, in, the entire, in, in the entire 50, quite frankly. Uh, we're right at the bottom as far as what we charge and what it costs the students to attend. We're a bargain, a, a real bargain. But I see opportunities that are happening right now that we should be talking about and focusing that a lot of things have already happened down in my part of the country, as in Senator Ingalls, agriculture was king and still is king and I'm encouraged because at one time we were saying well nobody wants to get into agriculture I'm seeing a lot of young farmers coming online mm -hmm. now and that's encouraging mm -hmm. they're all highly educated they're adopting the new technologies and that's taking place in New Mexico right now it's not something that's going to be taking place down the road we need to have find ways to help them add value to their products and one of the things our very Department of Agriculture and Jeff Whitty have programs where they mentor upcoming uh, agriculture farmers and ranchers with the old wise ones that know everything. And it's, there's a great effort being made there. I'm a little concerned about if we do go into a trade war with Mexico, a lot of our agricultural products, you know, we have a very deep, profound economic relationship with Mexico. We need to be able to, so, but that's, a, that's another show. Right? That's another show. So um, <clears throat> we're speaking today with Dr. No, the head of Senate Finance, Senator John Arthur Smith, and with our newly awarded mining ambassador, um, Senator Sue Engel from Portales. Um, the big picture, it, is it time for tax reform? How threatening is that? What is it, so closing loop, loopholes, is that viewed as tax increase? There are so many loopholes if you do the tax expenditure report where we've given tax breaks in the 
hundreds of millions of dollars. If we close those loopholes, can you get by the uh, what Jason Harper called the zombie Republicans who've pledged never to raise taxes? Do they consider closing a loophole a tax increase? Well, I think it's in the eye of the beholder on how they perceive that. If it's their uh, mm -hmm. tax loophole, uh, they want you to tax uh, some other loophole uh, mm -hmm. rather than theirs. Uh, I think Representative Harper uh, has a great idea. Uh, oftentimes we're condemned uh, when we offer encouragement to innovative thinking uh, on that, that you shouldn't even be going along that line. But I think uh, Representative Harper has, has opened up debate in the state of New Mexico, and, and I applaud him for that. I signed on that bill with him. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on that. Uh, I don't know how far it's going to get, um, but obviously he's trying to uh, lower our tax rates and broaden our base. Uh, and some of that's going to be include, include uh, uh, closing the loopholes uh, on that and also uh, on gross receipts, taxing them, some things that haven't been taxed uh, in, in the last few years. So uh, it's a debate, discussion that needs to take place, and, and uh, I think the representative uh, is on the right track. I'm not certain we're going to be able to accomplish anything in this uh, legislative uh, session uh, on that, but uh, that debate needs to be carried forward. Well, Lorraine, you know, in my first years up here, grocery receipts, uh, there's a gentleman that did most of the writing on that named Franklin Jones. and. Uh, I remember talking to him for a couple hours every week about taxes and things like that, and he said our grocery receipts tax are as, as, about as wide as you can get it on every service and occupation and things like that. But he said the thing about it is, he said, we've got a third of our counties that less than 10 percent of the people pay any income tax. And he said, I don't know when that's going to change. But I remember the first years I was up here, we were generating lots of dollars through gross receipts tax, and we rebated it back to people, particularly people whose income was below a certain level, got more. But everybody, almost everybody, got money back from our gross, our, our gross receipts tax that was coming in because it was generating more money than we needed. And we gave it back in rebates, and that worked very well. But once we started peeling off the gross receipts taxes, it seemed fine. Oil was $100 a barrel, natural gas was in 8 or $9. You get a picture of, gosh, if it's half, you know, if it's less much, it goes down 30%, we're still going to have all this dollars flowing in. Well, once you start doing that and you this one comes off, this one comes off, this one comes off, all of a sudden then your actual basic revenues really start to fall and we're we're having that now. The thing about it is, is we're going to have to look at everything we have to look at in state government this year and the coming years to make sure we're keeping things in some sort of a balance that makes this state work. Because there's a point there when we can't fix roads, we can't keep the funding going for education, and that's what every budget is full of is educational funding. Every governor, that's the main thing we spend. And we're in a world, different world than our folks to 2,000 miles east of us that can pass continuing resolutions and borrow money. We have to have a balanced budget or we come in and the state treasurer says, I've got to have a source of revenue or we're not writing any more mm -hmm. checks. And that's the difference in, in uh, New Mexico politics and federal politics. We actually have to make the decisions and either cut or figure out some way to fund things. And we're going to, this is never going to change. And there's going to be years when we have enough, and there's going to be years when we don't. And we've had several now that have been pretty tough years. We'll get through it, and it's amazing sometimes the whole world's going to come to an end when you cut something, and it doesn't. Hmm. We work through it, and the agencies work through it, and we get the <clears throat> job done. That's why I depend so much on your 60 years of experience because people tend to overreact and, and... Well, I'm just 40. I don't know how old he is. No, no, 60 years of experience. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's John. Well, we actually have about 80 years of experience. Well, that's and true. About, I, 60, I, about 60 in years this, in, in the, the Senate. legislature. In the Senate, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> on, on that. But that, you know, uh, Senator Engel brings out an excellent point. The uncertainty in New Mexico is a lot of it's a product of what's happening at the federal level. They have not given us certainty, and I'm not here to blast the new president nor condemn the last president. It's been an ongoing trip 
that we don't know whether we're going to have defense dollars tomorrow. Uh, we don't know what the Medicaid uh, reimbursement's going to be at. And it generates an awful lot of in uncertainty in the state of New Mexico. When we look at, at Medicaid itself, Medicaid is larger than when you count, about, count the federal money and the state money is larger than education in this mm -hmm. state. On a $6 billion budget, education is about $3.5 billion. Uh, on that, Medicaid is right at six billion when you look at the federal match. That's right. It's a forty-one uh, on that. match. Right? And and in the event that the feds withdraw, we're going to have people out there saying, "Well, heck, uh, we'll just cancel that program." What's going to happen? They're going to turn to the state and say, "The feds aren't picking up the bill. We want the state to pick up the bill." Uh, I've got physicians that aren't happy with the reimbursement rate, but they're also telling me, "Don't cut Medicaid uh, on on that." And and so you know with that mindset, I'm hoping that into the future that the public will have a better understanding that we need predictability from the federal government, but also that we're dealing with a lot of issues where we have to have a balanced budget in this state, and everybody has to be on board participating rather than protecting their own backside. I understand trying to do that, but we're all going to have to either share in the wealth or share in the pain, and we haven't reached that point yet. And so we have three really unique areas in that we are a state that has to operate on a balanced budget. We Don't we receive more federal money than any other state? Or uh, up there, we're up we're, one we're, of the top. And the we've top. depended on oil and gas f f and their largesse for many years, and we no longer have that. So you guys are left, as lawmakers, juggling these flaming torches. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I get calls, well, why don't you raise the corporate tax? Uh, we sort of forget those oil and gas companies pay you corporate tax uh, on that, and their ability to pay has been greatly diminished. Uh, the outlook in the future is still going to be very good, but with the technologies that have been developed, it's going to take uh, employ fewer and fewer people. Uh, so we've got to make those adjustments. We rely on our universities to help us make those adjustments with their students, but we're in a situation right now where our universities have lost over 3,000 jobs. Uh, UNM testified in front of us in the last three years they've lost 1,900 jobs. Some of that's part-time. Some of it was probably uh, uh, overstated. Uh, they had more people than what they needed. But even if you cut that number in half, it's still a, a significant number. State has uh, given up 726 jobs, collectively about 3,000 jobs when we look at it. And if we cut that in half, we've still had a, a huge loss. Uh, so those universities, are we're relying on them, but we can't keep squeezing them to death. I mean, every time we turn around, we're squeezing them for uh, more money. I mean, they've, universities have been hit heavily, uh, and they've stepped to the plate, uh, I hate to say willingly, but yes, they said, we'll participate. We need more uh, people in the state of New Mexico uh, willing to, to suck it up like the universities. Senator Engel has a wonderful president over in his area. Just tell me what you're going to give me, and I'm going to make it work mm -hmm. uh, yes, on that. Dr. Steve yes, Dr. Steve Gamble, Gamble right. Wonderful He's, president. But it's, yeah. a, it's one of those things. Every, every aspect of business in New Mexico, you know, the, copper, the price of copper is up. Our copper mines are going to do better a little bit. You know, oil and gas is here. It's, 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 the thing about it is the prices went down stops a lot of production for a while. Now they they seem to be holding a little bit steady. They are 56, 40 or something this morning. Last year about the time, this time they were about $25. Yeah. And uh, the thing about it is we've always had this, we'll always cope with it, but we have potential for so much industry still affiliated with the oil and gas industry. We've got tons of mining. You know, we have had our forests shut down. We used to have 10 or 15 sawmills in the state of New Mexico. Now we have two. We've got to come back to some common sense on some of these things that we do as far as, as uh, you know, the spotted owl virtually stopped all the sawmill stuff in New Mexico. The thing about it is our forests grow up. Pretty soon everything's falling over. Trees die. They fall over on each other. If it ever catches fire, you can't put it out. And then you have ground that has become so hot because of the amount of coal that's there. The, the soil is sterile. If you can see, there's a mountain from out of Los Alamos that basically is still blank because the fire was so burned so hot. 
I don't know when things will start growing there again. They will. But the thing about it is we've got to use common sense on some of these things and not put people out of business. Figure out how they can still stay there and work and keep people employed. And for goodness sakes, let's have common sense in what we're doing in the government. Because if we don't, it never works for anybody. Wise, wise words. We've got two minutes left. That's a minute for each one of you to... uh, we, we won't know what's going to happen with this session, and, and it may be scorched earth even by the time we're done, but give our viewers something to think about as they watch the next three weeks of the legislative session. Well, I can't uh, be real specific on that, but I do know that I was elected to try and make things work. And what I appreciate, appreciate about the New Mexico State Senate, I'll go home and they'll say, boy, that was a terrible session up there. You guys were fighting all along, uh, all the way. On the New Mexico State Senate side, we have not had that type of, of disruption. We've tried to work together collectively. Uh, that's one of the reasons Senator Engel and I are sitting right here. We get along. It doesn't mean we agree on everything, but we're here trying to make things work, and I think in the next few, few days uh, we're going to try and put something together, and we'll keep our fingers crossed and ask the public to pray for us uh, on that, but we're going to try and make this system work. Well, we always have, and we'll keep trying to do it. We have a specific time and a specific place that we uh, have to stop. And uh, at noon on the 60th day, we're done here. It's our job to get the job done. That's what we're sent up here for, and that's our task, and that's what we have to do. Everybody has to sometimes uh, cloak their ego just a little bit and realize they're here to serve people and uh, not how much they can uh, be uh, remembered and the thing about it is the job we do up here is very very important for our constituency and that's what we have to think about we're the people that hopefully hopefully are their voice and that's what we're here for well i'm so grateful to you both for coming you are true statesmen in new mexico and i really trust you to put the state's best interests at heart and to solve some pretty insoluble problems. So our guests today are Senator John Arthur Smith, Democrat from Deming, head of Senate Finance, thank you for all your hard work, and Republican from Portales, Senator Stu Engel, the minority floor leader in the Senate. You've been here together six years. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I hope you come back next year. Thank Thank you. you. Okay. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank our audience. You, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.